want to read a scripture in your hearing. We're going to look at Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. Exodus 25, verse 8. I have taught on bits and pieces of this before, uh, but God gave me a fresh approach, a fresh vision of what, uh, just another aspect. It's amazing how deep the Word of God is if you'll keep digging in it. It just keeps going forever. Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. <clears throat> and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. So he said, let them make me a sanctuary. So it's a tabernacle. It's a uh, tabernacle means tent or dwelling. So God said, I want you to make me a, uh, a, a, a portable dwelling place that I may dwell among you. I want to preach on the subject, God's mobile home. God's mobile home. Would you mind praying with me just for a moment? Lord, we're coming to you tonight. <clears throat> we are diving into your word. I pray that you would give anointing to me, the deliverer of your word, anoint the people and hearing of it, God, bring God, not revelation. There is no new revelation, but there is new understanding and illumination of the word of God. When you shed light on the word of God and we begin to see it and understand it, <laughs> you already gave your revelation, God, but we are just beginning to understand more and more of what it is. And I pray that you'd let it fit in, God, with everything else that we're doing in this church, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, God bless you. You may be seated. God's mobile home. <clears throat> Tabernacle was a temporary place for God to live. And jumping ahead, we, we as mobile homes, we have replaced the tabernacle. That's where the, that was the whole, obst the, the, the whole objective of, of this salvation thing. God dwelt with man in the garden, and then through all of this process, he wanted to restore that and, and also restore his dwelling place with us. And uh, we, we look at the Exodus 25, 8. God said it was the pattern of the tabernacle. So when we look after the pattern of the tabernacle, when you look at a pattern, a pattern is not the real issue. A pattern is only an, an outline. It's a shape of something that is to come. It's, it's not the real thing. So the tabernacle was not the real thing. The tabernacle was simply an outline of what was to come, which is the New Testament gospel as we know it. Tabernacle, the word tabernacle is mishkan, meaning residence or dwelling place. So God said, I want you to make me a dwelling place. I want to live among you. And as I mentioned, it's a portable dwelling place of God. And I mentioned that we replaced that. And it's found in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Dwelling place. You are now the dwelling place. You're the place where God meets with mankind. And so now God meets with us. He literally says, you are the shell. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. So we are a type of mobile dwelling place as well. We are God's mobile home. We're supposed to take God wherever we go. You've heard people say, this is not the church. This building, the bricks and the concrete and the, and the carpet, this is not the church. You're the church. And if you're the church and you're mobile, then you're the mobile home of God. So we are a mobile home. Never thought of it that way before. Think of it. The, the tabernacle was, was a structure. It was put up of posts and knops and and they tied it all together, and they put skins over the tabernacle. And inside that tabernacle, very quickly, the presence of God would dwell in the Holy of Holies. So you have the, you have the presence of God dwelling inside, inside a shell that is made up out of skin. Well, I see that, again, when we look at ourself, we are a shell that simply has the presence of God in it. We are skin with, <clears throat> with, this, with the presence of God in it. God is very consistent, but I've also seen it again. In John, <clears throat> excuse me, in John 1.14, the Bible says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. 
and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. The Bible says, and it says, the word was made flesh and dwelt. That word dwelt there is the same word as tabernacle tent. It's the same word. In other words, Jesus tabernacled amongst us. What do you mean? It was a shell. Think of it. The tabernacle originally was designed to be a mobile shell to house the presence of God. It, for the first time as I studied this this morning, it's, it, it came to me, Jesus was a mobile home as well. He was literally the mobile home of God. He was the mobile dwelling place of Almighty God. That's why the Bible says he tabernacled amongst us. He dwelt amongst us. It's the same word. So simply when you look at Jesus, you're not looking at another person. You're simply looking at a shell of God that God is moving and being mobile amongst us. He simply is tabernacling or tenting himself amongst us specific preparations were made. And whenever, whenever God does something magnificent, it's not just, you know, let's just, <clears throat> let's throw a few things together and see what happens. He's, he's extremely specific about what he does. And when he talked about the building of the tabernacle, he said, this is how, this is how long I want it to be. And this is how wide I want it to be. And this is how many posts I want. This is how far those posts need to be set apart. This is the material that you're going to make the posts out of. And the knobs will be made of silver. And this will be overlaid with brass. This will be overlaid with, with silver. This will be overlaid with gold. This will be, this will have seven branches on it. This will be a table and it will be this size. And you'll put this bread on it. And the altar of incense will be this size. He gave specifics for everything in the tabernacle plan, including about seven and a half foot for the, for the fence or so around the court, the outer court. It was all specified. So whenever God brings specifications to something, it's very important that we reverence it. And I, any, anybody hear about, you know, Hophni and Phinehas bringing strange fire unto God? That goes with all of what did, did first for the first time I found out what that was. It wasn't just a, it wasn't just a uh, irreverent act. It actually was in the Word of God, and it said, "If you approach, if you approach the holy things of God, if you get too close, the Levites were there. They were from the tribe of Levi. Then you have the the Aaron. Okay, the descendants of Aaron were the priests." When you look at that, sometimes people call, they use Levites and priests interchangeably, and they're not really, because they were all Levites, but not all Levites were priests. You get it? All priests were Levites, but all Levites were not priests. Okay? Levites were the whole family. The priests were of the lineage of Aaron only. So he said, the Levites can come and do this, this, and this, but they can't approach this. They can't get that close. And what happened is Nadab and Abihu had violated the thing. God said, we always thought that if you touch the ark, okay, like Yuza did, don't touch it, you fall over dead, right? They didn't touch it. They simply violated. God said, you can go this far, but you can't go any farther. If you get any closer... Then, then you're going to be judged immediately for all of that. And the judge of the priesthood came from God. The judge of Israel came from the, the Levitical priesthood. But the judge of the priesthood came from God. God said, you can't judge amongst yourself on that, on the ministry. Let me do that. So, so they violated and God burned them with fire. He said, nope, cross the line. That was it. We think it's only Yuza and it's not. It's Nadab and Abihu. It's Hophni and Phinehas. They all violated the Levitical laws of God. And so we look at that and think God is specific. We need to have reverence for that. And this generation has a hard time with that. They have a hard time with guidelines and rules and, and, and specifics and, and absolutes. They, they want wiggle room and everything because they can get out of it. But let's look for a minute. I want to grab my laser beam. Let's look at the dimensions. Um, we're going to look at the dimensions of the tabernacle for a minute. The Bible talks about it being 120 cubits. Now, a cubit is what they did is they said it's the span from uh, when you read in the Bible. It says cubit, cubit, cubit. It's like, what is that? It's the span from the wrist to the elbow, and that is about 18 inches. 
Okay, it varies a little bit, obviously, with per person, but it's about 18 inches, which is a foot and a half. So when they say it's 10 cubits, that's 15 feet. That's, it's very easy to, to calculate that. But when we look at the, so if it's 120 cubits, it's 120 cubits from there to here. So 120 cubits, which is about 180 feet. Now you're going to have to, we're going to give you a test on all of this when we're done. But these are the things that I wanted to show you. When we look when we look at the altar, here's the altar. It's actually backwards, but that's all right because the east, they always entered from the east. Always entered from the east like Jesus is going to enter Jerusalem from the east. That's why this was made. There's so, many, there's so much significance about this tabernacle. It's not even funny. You could study this thing for, for a year and not know it all. But what happens is when you have the entranceway here, okay? Remember, it's 180 feet from here to here, so it's 90 feet to the middle. You have, here's the entranceway. I always thought, and there were pictures, etc., and it talked about the dimensions of the tabernacle. And I always thought when you walk in the door of the tabernacle, there's the altar of sacrifice. It's like you bring an animal, it's like right there. No, no, it wasn't there. It was 45 feet from the, from the opening of the, the gates of the tabernacle to the altar of burnt offering. It was 45 feet. So think of this for a moment. When you walk into the tabernacle, hi, how you doing? Hey, Joe, how you doing? Great to meet you. Yeah, 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 I got to bring it. Uh, whew, that's a long ways. I got to bring the sacrifice. I was just taking my, taking my goat for a walk, you know? But then it's like 45. It'd be nice. It'd be real easy. And I, I think you're getting it already. It'd be real easy to drop the goat off and just say, and, and like untie the leash and just walk away but no, you, you had to grab that goat or that oxen and you, 45 feet, that's about from here to the door. That's a long ways. I know it's 60 feet from, from that wall to that wall. So it's about 45 feet from there. Think of that, grabbing that goat and walking. And that's just to the altar of sacrifice. So I have to take my sacrifice and walk in the midst of all this and drag that thing all the way up to that door. Anybody here ever, ever repent for the first time? That's a long walk, I'm telling you. You look at that altar and it's like, man, it's a long ways up there. You could be on the front row and it looks like 45 feet. It's like, man, I got to walk. I get, wow, that's a long way. Whew. But it's another 45 feet from the altar of sacrifice to the labor of water. So we make a decision, we make a decision when we come to church and we want to, we're going to repent. We're going to ask God to forgive us of our sin. And we look at that, that long walk and you think, man, it's just like, whoa, whoa, the, the corridor is shaking and you're looking down and, and the clouds are getting dark and lightning and thunder and, and you finally get there and you repent. And then all of a sudden you're like, I'm glad that's over. And they're like, next, <laughs> 45 more feet. Is the, is the laver of water. And that symbolizes baptism, obviously. It's the laver of water. He says, you must wash lest you die, so that you die not. So we have to get from the altar of sacrifice all the way to the laver. Of, that's another 45 feet. Man, that's a long ways. That's a long ways. But then we got the laver of water here, and from here to the opening of the tabernacle to where the holy place starts is only six feet. Very, very different. So notice, God is saying, I really want you to think about this repentance thing. I want you to, I don't want it just to be a jump in and jump out thing. I want you to, as you're walking down that, I want, I'm really sorry for what I did. And God, I really don't want to live that way. And I know that's sinful. And, and I know you don't like it. I know it's against your word. And I know sin won't make it into heaven. And I know, and I really, but I got friends. And, I, and he wants us to consider every step of the way. Are you willing literally to walk away from sin? I, I, and he doesn't want this to be, uh, okay, lift your hands and accept the Lord. I accept you. Oh, praise God. He's like, you got to walk that corridor. There's some things that you have to think about, but after you get that done, then it's easy sometimes for someone to say, well, now you got to be baptized in Jesus' name, and they show you in the scripture, and there's, there's you know, 5,000 scriptures on it. I'm just exaggerating a little bit. There's so many scriptures on baptism in Jesus' name, it's not even funny. But you do that, and, and immediately you run, and they jump, and it's like, no. 
got to walk the quarter. That's why John the Baptist, he looked, he said baptism is important, even though that was the antiquated one. He said there's a new baptism coming, and it has to do with Jesus. It has to do with the Messiah. You, you have to change it into that. But I still, he said, bring forth fruit, meet repentance. He's saying, don't do this flippantly. This is a commitment to God. This is a commitment to live for him. This is a commitment to take on his name and to be part of the bride of Christ. This is a long, you, you need to think about this. Because I've seen people get baptized and literally go out and get drunk that night. And they're like, well, you know, I got baptized today. You know, what, I wonder what they have for me next week. And it's like, no, no, this is important. This is, this is a long walk. In fact, the walk from here to the altar is just as important from the walk to there to there. But now notice, notice. The walk from here, from the labor into the holy, into the holy place is extremely short. Why is it? Why is it that when people get baptized and they, get, they, they, they repent, it takes them from here to about there to get involved in church? This area right here, this 30 by 15 area, is service to God. It's where they come and they bring the showbread. It's, it's where they come and fill the candelabra with oil. It's where they trim the wick and they bring the incense in here and put the incense right there at the altar of incense. And they, 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 they go through all the ceremonies and they're serving God and they swap out the bread and they eat the bread every seventh day and they go through all this stuff, but they're getting involved. And that's only six feet. That means from the labor of water to here, we need to start getting in. God, what can I do for you? What, what, please tell me, tell me, tell me what I can do for you. And we look, we notice that. And then, and then we look at this 30 foot area, this all, this, uh, this holy place. They call it the holy place. 30 by 15. Never knew until just a short while ago that how those things were actually placed. I always knew that the table of showbread was on my right and the candlestick was on my left and that the altar of incense was in the middle. But I never knew that it was specific. I never knew that it was exactly 15 feet from the front to where the candlestick was and the table of showbread. I never knew that. In other words, in a very short, one third of the distance that it took to baptize, one third of the distance that it took to, to, uh, to, to repent. Now, we can, now we're all of a sudden getting the light shedding on our journey and we're getting the bread, which is the word of God. We can literally begin eating the word of God and letting his light shine. The Bible says you are a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He said, you can already start receiving direction from God. You don't need to say, oh, I don't, I've never heard from God and I don't really know how the scriptures. That's why the Bible says study to show thyself approved unto God. Why? Because God said, once you repent and you're baptized, the, the word of God will start meaning more to you and you need to let it lead you. You need to let it mean something to you. You need to start deciphering it so that you understand more of God, not wait another 15 years before you start. Okay, where's that scripture? And is that, is that in the Bible? God doesn't want us to do that. He said, you need to start that right away. And then you move to the altar of incense. Now here's the, here's the kicker. It says in the Old Testament, a believer could only draw so close to God, then he or she had to be represented by a priest or the high priest the rest of the way. They could only go to the altar of sacrifice. They had to bring that sacrifice. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And then they had to turn it over to the priesthood. And the priesthood did everything else. The, Le the Levites actually were helpers to the priest. They could, they're the ones that, 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 that ported the tabernacle. They carried the tabernacle from Egypt, etc. They, when they put it all together, they were, they were moving it around. Okay. They're the ones that folded it up, moved it around, and they assisted the priesthood, etc. And so, um, let's look at this. We, we go 15 more feet from the candlestick in the altar to, to the, the altar of incense which was just before the veil. It was just before the veil right here. Here's the veil. So the altar of incense was literally 
inches. Inches. So notice the length. It goes 45, then it goes 30, and then it goes 15, 6 foot just to get into the place, and then it literally goes down to inches. In fact, the Bible in one place, it says the veil was up against the veil. It was right there, the altar of incense. So, so literally you can minister, you can serve God in the holy place, and you are literally inches away from where the glory is. So this all makes a difference because we get so used to this, this, uh, you know, I'll come to church and then I'll go through the motions and then sometimes we end up getting stuck in this place of service. The longest distances are from sin to repentance and from repentance to baptism. Six foot to get inside the place, the holy place. Fifteen foot to get to the candlestick and the table of showbread and then 15 more feet to get to the thing that represents the worship of God in just a few more inches. Talking about close. Talking about there are some times we think about where we've come from and the 45 feet that we had to walk for baptism and how that, or for repentance and how that affected us and the dying process that we went through for, for uh, repentance. And then, and then baptism, and it meant so much to us. And we go through another 45 feet, and, and, and really another 40, you go through another 45 feet to get all the way to where the ark is. But sometimes we stop just inches short of that because we're just so used to going through the motions. Can we see the next slide just for a moment? When we... Look at this slide. This, this, this is the tabernacle right here, okay? And this is definitely, this is set up right because the east is on, on the right. So when you look at this, this is very significant because all of the tribes, the 12 tribes would literally set up their tents around and they had a specific place that they were supposed to set up their tent. Then the priesthood, Levites, all of that, they would set up theirs inside inside this outer part and then of course the tabernacle was inside there but i want you to notice something about this first of all that little side note that, that you always approach from the east the door for the tabernacle was right here it was on the east so notice this even though on the right side we have judah and Issachar and zebulun okay this is called the camp of judah even though it has all three tribes on that side. You notice the camp of Dan, the camp of Ephraim, and the camp of Reuben. This is called the camp of Judah. The name Judah means praise. It's not, it's not a coincidence that the camp of praise is in front of the entranceway to the presence of God. Judah means praise. They called it the camp of... So it's the camp of praise. Anybody, any one of these tribes that wanted to go into the tabernacle and bring a sacrifice, they literally had to get close to the camp of praise. They, they, they had to come in that way because you had to enter here. This is closest to the camp of praise. If you want to get close to God, you need to learn how to praise. You need to learn how to give thanks and glory unto him for what he's done. But when we look at this, most of the tribes all around here, you think about it, most of these people, their, their only interaction with the tabernacle was when they messed up. When they messed up, when they did something against the word of God, they would make their way around here, come here, walk just inside the door, 45 feet, give their sacrifice and hightail it out of there. It was a place that they visited when they wanted to get rid of guilt when they wanted to eliminate the judgment of God, they simply, they, they, they went about their own business until they messed up and then they come in. There are some people that treat the church that way. I'm not, you know, I don't want anything to do with the church unless I really mess up and then, and then I need help. Hello, somebody help me out. I'm in trouble. So we have the outer people. Then, 
then there are those that actually come in and the, 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 the Levites and the priests, they, they minister in here. But you think they come and they receive the sacrifice and then they, they, they're at the door to the, to the altar, door to the altar, door to the altar, and they assist. So some, some people see the tabernacle, the church, as a place where they come from the door to the altar, from the door to the altar, from the door to the altar. Then there are those that, that, that minister from the altar to the laver, altar to the laver. In other words, they're baptized in Jesus' name. So when they come to the altar, they repent of their sins and they're like, God, I'm trying to get my life right. So the altar, and then they wash. Some of the priesthood would simply walk from the altar of sacrifice to the laver of water. They would wash off the blood, walk back to the altar of sacrifice, then come back to the laver and wash again. And they would do that over and over and over again. And God says there are some people that treat the church that way. They say, they, they, they treat it as if, um, you know, I need the church, I need the preaching because of the washing of the water by the word, and I need, I need a move of God so that I can get my heart right with God. But they simply go through the they go through that vicious cycle of, all right, I better run up to the altar again so that I can get washed because, so that I can make my baptism current. And, and, and that is a, it's a habit that we can get in. And this is not what this was for. This was for this place in here, the Holy of Holies. That's what this was for. God designed it to begin to get close to mankind again. And, and this was only a means to him but sometimes we look at, at, at the ceremonial part. We look at the task-oriented stuff, and we get so focused on that, we forget that God said, no, this is not about the altar of sacrifice, although you have to go there. This is not about only the, the, the labor of water, although you have to wash lest you die. It's about what's happening on the inside. It's about what's going in on the inside. And then we find... We find uh, uh, Lesser people, uh, uh, one of the points I wanted to make is that we've got these two or three million people that make their way to the front and stop. So we've got lots of people. And then we have fewer people that actually, actually uh, deal with the sacrifice right here. And then we have even fewer people yet, the, 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 the priesthood that go from the sacrifice to the labor. Fewer yet that go from the labor inside and deal with the bread and the candlestick and the incense even fewer yet. And even fewer yet, just one, the high priest, that would go into the Holy of Holies one time per year to offer the blood upon the mercy seat of God. So you notice, notice the, the illustration here. Lots of people, smaller amount of people, smaller yet, smaller yet, and even smaller, just one. Kind of like, kind of like when Jesus fed them with the loaves and the fishes, there were 5,000 people that wanted something from Jesus. And then you have 500 people that saw him and, and could have gone into the upper room, but there were only 120 that showed up. And, and then out of the 120, we look in one instance, Jesus sent out the 70. They, they were using the, the power of, of Jesus to minister to people. And then we have 12 disciples. And then we have three that were actually at the Mount of Transfiguration, all the way down to only one was at the cross where Jesus' blood was shed. Notice, the closer you get to God, the fewer there are that actually interact with him. There are, there are a few. It's the nature of mankind. Notice the signs when something really bad goes on in the world all the signs reflect it, you know, in God we trust and all of that. It's amazing how focused people are upon their relationship with God when everything is going bad. But it's amazing when, when Jesus is offering miracle signs and wonders, you get to the multitudes. The Bible says the multitudes came to him and he healed them all. Where were they on the day of the crucifixion? They were long gone. They didn't want anything to do with that. That, that was too gory. That was too, that was too committal to watch that thing, to, to, to see him suffer and die. But far less people, the closer you get, even fewer people take the coals to the altar, the altar of incense to worship God. So you can praise, you can enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. 
but it took worship to get into the Holy of Holies. It's easy to praise and thank God for the things that he's done, but it's harder just to worship him for who he is. It almost requires relationship because how do you worship a God for who he is when you don't really know who he is? You need to spend time figuring out who he is before real worship can come out. Um, but we need to learn to worship him. Um, the incense was before the veil. It was the last thing. It was worship. It was the last thing before they enter the glory of God. And when we enter the glory of God, we find, we find of course, the... Uh, you can go back to the tabernacle um, we, we find repentance in the altar of sacrifice. We find the labor of water representing baptism. We find the service of God represented by the other, the other items in the holy place. And then we find the glory of God settling into the holy of holy where one man met with God and the trembling and the worship and, and all of that. But that's what this is all about. It's about that holy of holy place that, that, that we want to get to. And the, when Jesus was on the cross, and the Bible says that, that when he died, it says that the veil, the veil that separated, which was the veil was right here. It, it, was, it was right, right where the altar of incense was. The veil was there, and that tore from top to bottom. But it's amazing how as it tore from top to bottom, it now, it now increased the size of this room because now it was no longer two sections, but it was just one big section. But when it tore from top to bottom, they say, I've never done it, but they say that you can train fleas. You can put them in a jar and put the cover on and they can jump up and hit their head and they jump up and they hit it and they jump up and they hit it. And eventually they're trained to where you can take the cover off and they'll jump only that high. They jump only so high. They just... They just think, if I just jump, if I jump any higher, I'll just hit my head, and why bother? So I don't want to do that. Um, so they don't even need a cover on it. But we can get the same way in the tabernacle, in our approach to God. We can say, Lord, I have failed you, and I need to repent. So we come to the altar of sacrifice. And then we can, we can get washed in the laver of water. If you've been baptized in Jesus' name, simple repentance renews that experience and renews the power of the blood, covering our sins, washing them away. So we can do that and we can get involved in the service of God because remember, nobody else was allowed back there except the, holy, except the high priest one time a year. So no one else was allowed. But now it was torn from top to bottom. So it was wide open. Yet sometimes we can find ourselves getting used to saying, well, you know, only certain people are supposed to go there, or a certain person. And now, even though the veil is torn, remember when they offered that incense, they were literally inches away from the glory of God, just inches. I wonder the guy that offered the incense the first time he walked in there after the veil was torn. Imagine walk it. Uh, wow, that's really close. That's really close to where the glory. Man, I don't know. I, I see with the veil there, you feel kind of protected. But now that the veil's gone, I have access. But I can be so trained and familiar and comfortable with going up to the altar of incense and putting the incense on with the fire and it begins to smoke and you walk away and you think I've done what I'm supposed to do and yet the veil is no longer there. The veil is gone. But we get so used to what we're doing. There's many times when I pray with people and uh, uh, I, sense, I sense them coming up to that line again. They'll begin to approach God and they're used to where they are. Even though they're feeling the power of God, they may be, might be speaking in tongues, they might be trembling, tears coming, etc. But, but they're literally standing at the edge of their familiar zone. This is what I'm comfortable with. I'm comfortable going up to the altar of incense and offering my incense, but I, crossing over into that, I don't know about that. But you realize how far you've come? 45 feet and then 45, and then 6, and then 
15 and then 15, and I'm right there. I'm literally that close. How many times was that person who offered the incense inches away from the absolute Shekinah glory of God? How many times? How many times did he offer that, 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 that incense offering unto God and was literally inches? I wonder tonight how many times we have begun to worship and we start to feel like, oh, this is a little intense. And we start to invite and move forward and, and begin to approach him. We get past the altar. We get past the laver. And we get into the holy place and we, we, we see the altar of incense and we get up to it. We, we begin to offer our worship and, and all of a sudden the brakes get put on. And we're like, man, I don't know. That's, that's pretty intense in there. That's, that's really powerful. And we're just not quite comfortable moving across that line. Yet isn't that what this is all about? This whole thing about salvation is reuniting with God. It's all about intimate interaction with the Creator. It's not somebody doing it for you. Then somebody did it for us. Now we have to do it ourselves. He said, no one can approach me for you anymore. It's not possible. We can't, I can't forgive. I, 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 can't, I can't remit somebody's sins. I can forgive something they've done to me, but I can't forgive their sin. That's not possible. Only God can do that. So you have to go to him. But yet we're comfortable in this area right here. We, and those are people that say, I really want to do something for God. And they actually get involved in the kingdom. But God says that's good, but it's not for that purpose. The whole purpose is to reunite with me. God says, I want a relationship with you. I want you to think about something. Um, think about all that was enacted. I mean, they had to, they did something wrong. They had to remember what the law was. According to the law, I have to bring a goat. All right. So they had to go out to their flock and they had to go through the flock and pick out the best one. And they had a, yeah, okay, there's the best one. Then depending on where they were, they had to take that goat all the way to the tabernacle. And inside the tabernacle, 45 feet, they had to, they had to go all the way to do that. And then the priest had to take the blood, or actually, I'll get into that a little bit more, but think of all that they had to go through. Then the priest had to do what they're supposed to do. Then he had to go and wash. And then, and then they go inside the, inside the holy place and minister. All of that had to be done. And they finally get next to the veil and offer the, uh, the, the sacrifice of incense there. You think of all of that. And my question for myself, when I started looking at all that they go through, to get to the altar of incense and think, what did that accomplish? Nothing. Simple obedience. It didn't roll away their sins yet. Not yet. Not until the day of atonement. It simply withheld the judgment of God temporarily. But when you think about it, all of that done, all of that, all of that cost, all of that, that, that activity, all of those ceremonial things that they had to do from a clean standpoint. And all of a sudden, one man comes up that one day of atonement and he grabs the blood, makes his way inside the veil, puts the, puts the blood on the mercy seat. He goes three inches farther than the other people and everything happened in those three inches. All he had to do was get inside that veil. It was dark. He couldn't see anything. So all he had to do was grab that basin of blood and start flicking his fingers like that. And hopefully as soon as that drop hit that mercy seat, boom, it was done. He didn't have to go all the way up to the mercy seat. He simply needed to get inside the room 
and, and, and start flinging that blood around until it hit. And then it was done. In other words, a lot of the things that we do, they are acts of service and they are acts of obedience. But nothing spiritually really gets done until that last three inches, until we enter his presence. That's what this is all about. It's not about just being faithful, although we need to. We needed to be washed, otherwise we die. There are things that we have to do before we enter his presence because he gave us those specifics. He said, if this is who you are, you can only enter so far. You can come this far. You can do this. You can do that. But if you do that, it has to be this, this, and this. All these rules and stuff, that was simply to continue living. But to actually get the atonement done, it was that final three inches. More was done in that three inches than what was accomplished with everything else that they did. Have you ever been to a service and you had people pray for you? Weeks go by, months go by, still having trouble, anxiety, fear, all these things. And all of a sudden, one day you come and you enter his glory and you look and you say, wow, more was done right there than all the other stuff that was done. More has been accomplished in my life in a few moments in his glory than anything else that I've done. I simply went through all that stuff to get there. Do you realize that more was done with those few moments in his presence? I can tell you, I can go back to the square of carpet I was on when I experienced that reverberating glory of God that hit me and it changed my life in a few moments. Think about it. I, I, I went up to that altar. It was right about here in Menasha, Wisconsin. It was right there. I'm probably within inches right here. I can, I know, and I was sitting right there when I got the Holy Ghost. I know exactly where those moments of glory where I entered his presence. When I repented, I got up from there. Drugs, alcohol, tobacco, you name it. It was broken in, in that in that few moments, it wasn't, it wasn't the hour of prayer that I started within weeks of there. It wasn't, it was a few moments. The glory took care of more in a few moments than all the prayer. I'm not saying not to pray. Don't, don't you put that. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is sometimes we pray and we pray and we pray and we fast and we pray and we fast. And I'm like, would you just go get in his glory? Would you just do that and watch what God will do? Yes. Sometimes we get like robots and we, I pray every day for an hour, every day for an hour. I pray and I, and we start and God's like, are you serious? I didn't develop robots. I want someone to love me and I want to love them. I want you to get close to me. Three inches closer, just three inches closer. <clears throat> but the greatest impact. We can't start there, though. We can't get there without blood. You enter that Holy of Holies without blood, and you're toast. And you know what I mean by that. You can't do that. God won't even let you do that. He won't let that kind of, that kind of uh, uh, corruption get that close to him without repentance. It just won't happen. So washing is necessary to go in. So yes, all these things are necessary, but that's not the objective. The objective is a loving relationship with him. Blue, purple, and crimson, or red, with the colors of the veil, re represents, anybody believe in the oneness of God, it represents heaven. Blue is heaven. Red is the earth or clay. And purple is a mixture of the two. Red, or, or blue, red, and purple. That was on the veil. The Bible says, and the veil was his flesh. It was an indication of 
God interacting with man, creating this shell with the presence of God, which was a mixture, it was purple. And that veil was torn. It was rent in twain from top to bottom. Jesus' side was torn open as the blood and water flowed out of his side. Purple is also, I found out through my study this week, purple is the color of royalty. (laughs) For the first time I saw, don't they call him the king of kings? Heaven and earth got together and created a king of kings. It was purple. They mixed the two. According to Strong, royalty would eventually come as a mediator between God, which is blue, and men, which is brown, and a victim with a twofold nature and dignity. He said, all of the tabernacle indicated that there would be a sacrifice. God would get together with humanity. And since things were always done in the same order, and I'm getting close, since things were always done in the same order, you look at blue, purple, red, gold were the posts that they hung on, and white was the linen. It was the, it was the thing that the high priest wore. Notice, since blue equals heaven, purple equals royalty, red equals blood, gold equals purchase, because that's what they use to, they use gold for, for, for coins, etc. Gold equals purchase, and white equals purity. It very well could mean that heaven, royal, blood, purchased purity. Yeah, that's what I said. Wow, that's really good. Let's dive in just a little bit more. Let's look at what they call, they call a Hebrew idiomatic arrangement. Looking at the five substances of colors when mentioned together in this connection, straight out of the research, in the same order, which is gold and violet, which is gold and violet, which is wool, purple, which is wool, and crimson wool, and bleached linen. The English equivalent would be this, in the Hebrew first, yiknu hash shamayim mim malchem bidam oeth tahoreth enu. That's what those words mean the gold, the blue, the, the, the... Let me read to you what that means in the English. Will by heavens from their king by his blood are cleansing. When you put those words together the right way, it means heaven will procure of its king our purification with his own blood. Let me say that again. Heaven will procure or secure of its king our purification with his own blood. Acts 20. The church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Wow. God. They came in through the outer court with the sacrifice. You have the labor, you have the the altar of sacrifice. Prerequisites to go further. The next removal from secular life was the holy place, which no Levite was ordinarily admitted. It became exclusive priesthood ministering to God. And under the gospel, this whole system of human intervention is wiped out. We think under the gospel, God wiped that all out. We have access. Notice in, that, in, in, in 1 Peter 2, 9, it says that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. He says you are, he didn't say you are a royal Levitical. He said you are a royal priesthood. That means you have access all the way in. Then there was the innermost chamber, which was the most holy place. It's where only the high priest could en- enter. And I talked about, you know, it's funny. The priest in Hebrew is Cohen. Does that sound familiar? Ellie Cohen. She's from the tribe of Aaron, from the, from the, the Levitical tribe and the specific uh, lineage of Aaron. That's where we get the common Jewish surname Cohen. The priests were charged with ministering to the Lord first. Daily they offered sacrifices, burnt incense in the holy place. They tended the lamps on the lampstand. Weekly they renewed the bread of the presence and ate of the loaves. Their first focus was on God, but then their second focus was on the people. So we look at, uh, I want to talk about the burnt offering in the next three minutes. This is important. The details of this you can find for reference in Leviticus chapter 1. So sacrifice, their sacrifice, I talked about going out and finding a sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice. So we can't pawn off on God a substandard animal. It has to be perfect. When we come to God and we want to repent, God said, 
Don't enter that haphazardly. I want a perfect sacrifice. I want, and that's the problem with, 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 with sin, is typically repentance is dealt with until we no longer feel bad about it. But we don't completely deal with it. We don't bring the best sacrifice. I have never, I have never dealt, I've never had a temptation on cigarettes, drugs, alcohol, again, ever, since that. Because I brought that perfect sacrifice, I did that. I'm not perfect, but I've never had a problem with that. When we truly repent, when we truly bring that sacrifice and it's killed, it's over, it's done. There are some things that we struggle with that we need to bring that to the Lord and we need to bring the complete sacrifice. Um, the, second, uh, uh, the second thing is if we bring the best sacrifice, that's the most expensive one. God is trying to tell us through this that repentance is costly. Sin is costly. When we violate the word of God, it costs us something. This generation just comes with, I'm sorry, you know, get over it. And God says, this is a costly thing. When we violate the word of God, it's going to cost us something. Now, we don't drag, you know, our most choice goat to the altar. But he says, you need to bring your sacrifice. This, you need to pay for this with repentance. You need to die to this. You're the sacrifice. Doesn't it say we are supposed to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. The second part of that is the offerer. The person that brings that sacrifice is supposed to lay their hands upon that sacrifice and confess. God, I stole that thing. We're supposed to get in, not, not, sorry. God says, we need to be, God, I don't want to be like that anymore. They came and they, they gave themselves. They told God, God, this is what I did and this is what I did. Now, I don't expect you to do that tonight and give a list of all the stuff, but there's some things that we need to talk to him about, not just, well, you know, God, I want to make heaven, so I'm sorry. We need to go to the mat and say, God, you know what? I had a bad attitude. God, I said some things that weren't right. God, I did. This is what I did. And I know you told me not to. And I'm sorry. And with your help, I'll never do that again. I want to be right with you. And I'm finishing. You can stand with me because we're, we're going to talk about uh, sacrifice. But my understanding before yesterday was that I would bring that goat and I would just Hand it over to the priesthood and say, we'll see you later. But in Leviticus, it says the priest doesn't do the killing. It is at the hands of the sinner himself. Well, God, you'll take it away from me. No, he won't. He'll say, bring your sacrifice. All right, now you kill it. You know how gory that would be? You grab, out, you grab a knife and that thing's hollering and screaming at you and you've got it around the neck and you're, you're, and you're trying to slit its throat and blood is all over you and the thing is screaming and people are watching you and you're, that's horrible. And yet when we come to repentance, that's what it's supposed to be like. We're supposed to say, God, there's something wrong in me and I'm coming up to this altar and I'm going to kill it. It's not your responsibility, it's mine. But you catch, capture the blood, and you put the blood on the altar, which makes everything okay. That's where the Levite, or that's where the priesthood took over. But he had to kill it, and he had to skin it and cut it up. And then the priesthood took it from there. Our responsibility in the sacrifice is far greater than what we typically think. God said, the reason your repentance isn't working is because you're not involved. You're simply trying to let somebody else do it for you. Oh, come on, Bishop, preach a, preach a more intense message. Pray and fast and bring a red hot message so that I can pray through. God's like, that'll never help you. We're saved by the foolishness of preaching, but preaching brings people to repentance. And repentance causes you to kill that thing that keeps tripping you up. And therefore you go, after that, you go to the labor of water and you wash off that blood and you go, it's dead. It'll never bother me again. That's what we're supposed to do. It's dead. I Can't you smell it burning? Can't you smell that old barbecue burning on the altar of sacrifice? Look at all that smoke. It's dead. That's how I felt after I got free. Praise God. 
the sacrifice was completely consumed. When it says that we're supposed to be a living sacrifice, be consumed. The Bible says, Psalms 16, and know that I am God, I will be exalted among the heathen, I will be exalted in all the earth. That word is consumed there. Be still. Be still and know that I am God. That still there means consumed. We need to be consumed. What do you mean? That means we need to get on the altar as a living sacrifice. And we need to be consumed. Don't leave anything left. Because whatever's left in the flesh will get you. It will take you down. But we look at the Sometimes it's a long walk. Sometimes. Oh, wow. There's one more scripture. Matthew 5, 23. If you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, that's what this is about. When they came to offer their sacrifice, the priesthood, they were like, okay, I'm, I did this, I did that. Oh, there's something I have to do. Before I offer that sacrifice, I got to run back and take care of this because I'm supposed to offer that sacrifice in right standing with God. So I have to do that. God says, according to this, that if we bring our gift to the altar and remember that our brother has something against us, we're supposed to leave our gift there in front of the altar. Go and reconcile to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Everyone say that's hard. We don't do that. We just come and pray and hope, hopefully feel the presence of God. That is scripture. If you truly want to be free, let's follow the word. It doesn't say if I have something against you, I need to tell him. I'm going to tell him all about you. Man, here, here's what I know about it says I'm supposed to go to him. If I got a problem with Miguel, I need, to, I need to leave my sacrifice right here. And I need to go and say, brother, I'm sorry. I know you're mad at me. I'm sorry. What did I do? God said that our, offer, that our sacrifice will be accepted if we'll do that. Well, what if we don't? I got a feeling there's a lot of sacrifices that aren't accepted because we don't do it right. This whole thing tabernacle was a type and foreshadow of the church. It was an absolute pattern. If that's what they did then, then it's what we need to do now. Even though we'd be embarrassed, you know, I'm just not, I don't like conflict. Welcome to the team. I hate conflict. But if we want to be released from it and possibly release him, if I go to him and I say, bro, I got, I want to talk to you. Something miraculous could happen. I could be released. He could be released. But something powerful would happen. Otherwise, God wouldn't tell us to do it. But we need to make a decision tonight and say, God, it's in your word. I know I can confess it unto you. But doesn't the Bible say confess your faults one, two? Doesn't it say confess your faults one to another? All right, some of you are really nervous right now. It means the faults that you committed against them. I'm not going to tell you what I did to him. I don't need to tell you and inform you about all. If I did something to you, confess your faults one. Hey, here, I got a fault that I, I, I hurt you and I'm so sorry. We're supposed to, those we're supposed to confess. Well, I'll just confess it to God. Oh, come on, that's way too easy. God, I'm sorry. <laughs> Done with that. It's harder to go to the person and fix it than it is just to, we're supposed to do both. Because you can't forgive my sin, but you can forgive my fault. Oh, you can forgive that offense. And it might save you. If we love each other the way we're supposed to, then we would deal with each other that way. You might say, well, it won't do anything for me. That's not what the kingdom of God is about in the first place. It's not about what's in it for me. 
It's about what can I do to serve the king? And if the king wants me to do that for another one of his servants, then I ought to be willing to do that. Could we come up to the altar tonight and just think, Lord, Lord, there's some things I've been struggling with. I obviously haven't died yet. I ask you to help me, Lord. Because if I don't forgive, or if I don't make things right when I know you said, if a brother hath ought against you, God, God help me. My flesh is dragging its heels the whole 45 feet from the front of the gate all the way to the altar of sacrifice. My flesh doesn't want to do this, but you said we needed to be a living sacrifice. You told me that real repentance will deliver me. That repentance separates me. God, at the altar of sacrifice, there was already blood flowing. The application of blood started already at the altar. The process was already started. God, I pray, help me, Lord, to follow your word. Help me to submit to your word. Help me, Lord, to really apply myself to the word of God. The church in the end time needs to be so unified. And how can be we how can we be unified when there's so many offenses and so many failures, so many bad feelings, God? It's because we're not following the word. All oh, we're baptized in Jesus' name. We're filled with the Holy Ghost. But oh God, that's just the birth. Now maturity needs to bring us to literally making things right, if we can. Can we restore a brother? Doesn't it say that in the word? You that are spiritual, restore another. It doesn't say bury or make fun of or separate ourselves from. It says restore them. God, our, our desire needs to be to restore each other all the way, God, and I pray that you would help us, lead us, speak to us. Speak to us about whatever circumstance that you want us to fix. It might restore somebody else. It may do nothing for me, but it may restore somebody else. God, I pray that you would give me the courage to put my living sacrifice on that, sa on that altar. God, crying out like you did. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. God, if it's possible, can I please, may I please avoid this? No. No, it's not possible. Lord, you spoke to us tonight. It is so important, church. But I've been in the church 30 years. Makes no difference. The scripture doesn't change according to how many years you've been in the church. You need to think about somebody. Somebody you think is offended at you. Or may not have to do it tonight. But think about it. Approach them. Call them. Meet them somewhere for coffee and say, I'm not sure what it is, but there's something between us and I want to get it out in the open. I want to fix it because I want to be right with God. I'll apologize if I need to. But I don't know what else to do. But if we do what we're supposed to do, God will do what only he can do. Oh, Lord, wash my heart, God. I pray that you would let me die to myself, that I'd be willing to do anything that you ask me to do. And remember, my whole purpose tonight is to make my way into the Holy of Holies 
past the sacrifice, past the washing, past the worship. If you feel like you've truly repented, then begin to worship. Don't end tonight on death. End tonight on life. Death at the altar, but life in the Holy of Holies. The Bible said that the Spirit, if the Spirit dwell in you that raised Him from the dead, then that same Spirit will raise us up to walk in newness of life. God said it will bring life if we interact in the Holy Ghost. And we need to do that tonight. We need to make our way into the Holy of Holies. But don't just jump into that room or parachute in. But make your way past the altar of sacrifice and say, God, if there's anything that separates me from you, I'm headed to the Holy of Holies because that's where the miracles happen. That's where the atonement happened. That's where the blood was applied on the mercy seat of God. That's where the interaction with you happened. And I want to go there again, God. Church, I don't know about you, but I've had a hunger these last few months. I, I'm trying to make my way back to that, that innocent approach to God where everything was a new wonder. It was, there was a twinkle in my eye. There was, there was an awe and a wonder every time I would feel his presence. And I'm saying, God, that's being a child in the spirit. I want to go back there again, God, because I know that's what you want. Where is that awe and that wonder in our hearts when we approach him? Or is it just another, is it just another goosebump machine where I feel his presence and I'm comfortable there, so I just leave him behind the veil? Oh God, God, give us a desire. Give us a desire to press through that veil press through the veil which was his flesh. Let's press through the flesh tonight. Press through into the Holy of Holies and begin to worship. Let's bring that incense. Let's not leave the incense on the outside of the veil in the holy place, but let's bring it all the way in like the high priest did with that censer. Oh God, I worship you. I worship you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, make a decision. I'm going in. Just begin to worship. If you've repented, it's time to begin to worship Him. Let's worship Him tonight. Oh, Lord of glory, my King of kings, the one who purchased me with your own blood, my royalty, my crown, my crown king. Oh, Lord, I love you. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for making a way for me to approach you. Thank you. Thank you for directing my journey to you and making it possible for me to get into that glory cloud. Hallelujah. God, I love you. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, that's it. That's it. Let your sacrifice be on the altar. Oh. Not my will. Not my will. But thy will be done. Not my will. But thy will. Thy will be done. Oh, holy, 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 holy God, holy God, holy God, holy God, you are great, you are awesome, you are wonderful, you are full of wonder, you are merciful and kind to us. Thank you for being patient with me, Lord, as I make my way back to that innocent child in the spirit, enjoying your presence like I used to, and not just going through a ritual to get there, but God, anticipating your glory. Lord, help me be willing to do whatever it takes, whatever it takes, God. Whatever it takes. 
sacrifice tonight, God. Give my best sacrifice. Lord, they didn't cut a piece off and leave part of it there. Lord, when they brought that sacrifice, it was an all or nothing. It was an all or nothing deal. God, I pray that you'd help me to bring my whole sacrifice to you. God, my priorities, my desires, God, my plans, let me bring them to you, Lord, and let me submit them to you on the altar, God. I'm 